All right, praise team, we appreciate that. Man, I tell you what, I'm so glad you're out tonight because this is really almost a controversial subject. And uh, one of the things I want you to know is that I know people that I love who've had abortions. I also know about three weeks ago that she doesn't know. I hear that in my ears, it's echoing. And uh, that she doesn't know, and there was a young lady probably in her 18, about 18, 19, and what she doesn't know is that her mother was in New Orleans about to have an abortion, and somebody was down there in front of the abortion clinic and knew who I was and, knew, and called me <laughs> and said, I want you to know that you've got a friend. Uh, I know you know who they are, and she's down here going to have an abortion. And, you know, and they said, you can't tell because I could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and uh, I called her and called her parents and uh, went through it, and she decided not to. And, and I had the wonderful privilege just a few weeks ago to see that child uh, in our church. And so that was great, yeah. <laughs> but I also want you to know there's a lot of people that love the Lord and have had those abortions and uh, not justifying what they did anymore that justify things that I do that I shouldn't. So we want to show them grace and mercy, okay? It's, it's said that we've got a weak nation because we have weak churches. We have weak churches because we have weak homes. We have weak homes because we have weak fathers. We have weak fathers because nobody's taught them in. I only say that because next Wednesday night, you'll want to be here. We're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper together. And I want to encourage you to be here because I think it's a time that you can get confessed up and freed up like no other time. The week after that, I think it's the 13th, we'll start a new Wednesday night series. I'll be teaching the original Kingdom Man that started our men's group when it very started and God really blessed it. Sharon will be teaching Kingdom Woman. And I want to encourage you to pray about coming to be a part of that because my goal and my purpose for the next few weeks is uh, I want us to have great marriages. And uh, this coming Sunday, we'll be preaching about marriage boot camp. And uh, I'm excited about it, but I also know so many times when I go through a series, God lets me go through that. So uh, praying for that as well. If you have the outlines, you know that they did a wonderful job putting together a small booklet on abortion. And I would say that you take it home. Some of it's what we're going to go through tonight, and some of it's some resources, outlines that I have for you. If you're watching online or on Facebook and you want the outline, which I would strongly suggest that you get it, if you want to send us our, our messages on Facebook and let us know what your email is or something, we'll send you the original outline, okay? All right, what I want you to know about abortion is abortion is socially acceptable today. It's biblically wrong. Uh, we are allowing tradition and uh, to outweigh the truth. But I want you to know uh, the problem's not really the problem. Uh, we're going to be starting a series this Sunday called Marriage Boot Camp. What I've learned through this study is so many times marriage problems that they are not what they really think they are. The abortion problem is not really what I thought it was when I started. Uh, the, the, the problem is the same problem that it's been since the beginning. Uh, the problem is we either don't believe the Bible, we don't know the Bible, or we think we're smarter than the Bible. See, that's where all sin starts. Even, even back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, it said, The serpent said to the woman, You'll surely not die. And, and for God knows the day that you eat, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And they got the experience of evil. So the woman, she saw that the tree was good for the food and pleasant for the eye, and the tree was desirable uh, to make one wise, worldly wisdom. There's a big difference in godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. So she took the fruit she ate, and she gave it to her husband, and he ate. See, Adam and Eve, without knowing it, if you don't know the truth, what they, they said, really, we're either smarter than God, or we think God's holding out on us. See, the number one problem with abortion, even in New York, that they're going to allow abortions up to birth, is really, it's a spiritual problem. 
The reason that we have what's going on today in, in, in the problem in the world is most of our problems are really spiritual problems. Most of our marriage problems are really spiritual problems. Most of our financial problems are really spiritual problems. And what people do, just like Adam and Eve, they don't want to take the responsibility, so they make excuses. They say, well, God doesn't know enough, so I'll do it my way. Uh, Romans 13.1 says, every soul is subject to to the governing authorities. But what it says after that, there is no authority except for God. Yeah. There's no authority except for what? God. For God. See, the main reason that we have so many spiritual problems is because we don't have an ultimate authority. Yeah. See, God's word, if it's not the ultimate authority, who is? Is mm. it the government? Is it your mate? Is it New York? I mean, you, you see, when families and nations, when they don't have an ultimate authority, it results in no authority, and everybody begins to do what's right in their own eyes. That's really what's going on. Proverbs 26, 12 says this. Uh, do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? <laughs> uh, there's more hope for a fool than there is for them. The judges in Judge 17, 6, it said, in those days there was no king of Israel. But so every man began to do what was right in his own eye. When we don't have the king of kings and the Lord of lords in our life, we don't have an authority, we begin to do what's right in our own eyes. And in Deuteronomy 12, it said, You shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man, whosoever is, whatever he thinks is right in his own eye, he said, don't do that. Proverbs 14, uh, 12 says, There is a way that seems right in the man, uh, uh, even even New York that passed that. Do y'all do y'all understand when they passed the legislation to have uh, birth up to I mean abortions up to almost to nine months? They all stood up and applauded. Yeah. So, but the Bible says they he, a man that does what he seems right, but he, he said the end's going to be death. There is spiritual death taking place every single day, and I believe it can also lead to spiritual death. So when you continue to live with right in your eyes instead of God's eyes, it said it's going to end up death. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they said you will surely die. The death was they got immediately separated from God. Now, God always offers some grace. But so he's saying that's what's happening. So the more you, you do it in your own eyes, the further and further you get away from God's. God's word has to be the ultimate authority or there is no real authority. And when there's no real authority, you have chaos and confusion. What do you really think is going on in America today? I mean, it's chaos and confusion. Amen? Yeah. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, first of all, and the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. In other words, even, even everybody's got a, an authority they go to, you know. But he said, but God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Real confusion and chaos comes because we try to be our author, the creator, the master of our life, and our marriage and finances. When there's a disagreement and you both think you're right, whether it's at home, at church, on your job, and everything, what are you going to do? Who's going to be the ultimate authority? What are you going to do in your marriage when you both don't agree on something? But it's, instead of getting little, now it's getting big. Well, there's two things you do. You'd like to say, what does God's word say about the matter? Let that settle the matter. And if you can't do that, you get somebody that's wiser than you that you both agree on, and you bring them the matter. So if you don't, you'll have confusion. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine and proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. The message puts it this way. Every part of the scripture is God-breathed. It's useful one way or another, it's showing us the truth, it's exposing our rebellion, it's correcting our mistakes, and it's training us to live God's way. What does that? The scripture does. So what did I tell you? First of all, the problem's not the real problem. If you came here tonight with a big problem, it's probably not the problem. You probably had not got to the root of the problem. Most all problems are spiritual problems. God has to be the ultimate authority or there's no real authority how, how, how do you respond to those that you disagree with then? How do you respond to those that say, I feel it's okay to have abortion uh, almost up to birth? It's socially acceptable. It's legal. 
You teach them the word, sure, but most of the time they're not going to respond to the word. You do understand most of the people here tonight, 99 and 9 tenths of you, think that you shouldn't have abortions. Amen? And just like the other people that don't that agree abortion's all right, if I tell them this is what God's word said, they don't care. No authority. Second Timothy two is very important. It says gently instruct those who oppose the truth. How do how do we do it? Gently. gently. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts. You, you understand what's wrong in America? What's wrong with abortion? What's wrong in our lives? And our it's hard heartness. I have told you when your heart is hard, you will hurt people. Yeah. Maybe they'll learn the truth. Uh, then what if they come to their senses and escape the devil's trap? For they have, had, they have been held captive by him and they do whatever he wants. So see, what, what's going on is there's this huge spiritual war that we don't see. And then people that have rejected the truth, Satan's going, Amen. I, he has then blinded them from the truth. So they're not going to bait you with God's word and it says the only thing you can do is, is, is do it gently. Another translation says do it in humility. I'm studying humility right now and what I've decided the truest sense of being humble is I can look at you and say I want the best for you. I, I want you to be a better person. I don't want what from you. I'm not concerned about what you're giving me. I want the very best I can for you. I want the best for you. I want the best for your family. You know, I can honestly say, and God knows my heart, I don't come up here for what I can get. I come up here because I want us to have better families because of what I can give. The truest sense of humility is you look at there and you say, hey, what can I do? And the Bible says you humbly correct those who are in opposition. Maybe God, perhaps, he will grant them repentance. So that they may know the truth and then they may come to their senses. They could then, they could escape the snare of the devil. They've been taken captive to do his will. So what I want you to know is there, there's a captivity by the enemy that they don't even know they're in captivity. And they do what God, I mean what the devil wants them to do. F fifth, how do we respond? I'm going to get to what I believe about abortion yet, all right? But what I said, abortion is not the problem. The problem is we have a spiritual problem in our nation. Okay. How, how, how do we respond to those that have had abortion? Well, ultimately, God's the ultimate authority, not how you feel. If you keep responding on how you feel, we're never going to change people's lives. Amen? I mean, I don't care how you feel about homosexuality. When they walk in that door, you're going to love them. Amen? I mean, the church has run more people off by being ugly than ever by being kind and gentle. Malachi 7, 19 says, He, God said again, I have compassion upon them. I will subdue their iniquities. I'm going to cast their sin away. God said, hey, my mercy and compassion is new every single day. So he wants us to be a compassionate, merciful people. We need them to know that God says in Philippians 3, uh, 3, it says, we want you to forgetting those things behind you. We strain for you to go forward. We want you to forget what's behind you and do your very best to go forward. You can't control what's behind you, but you can control what you're here today and where you're going. The Bible does say in 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of all sins. He doesn't categorize and say God's going to forgive you of some. He's not y'all and he is y'all. He says when we confess it, he said it is forsaken and he forgives us. He said he takes our sins as far as the east to the west. So how do we respond? We say we want to show mercy, we want to show kindness, and we want every single person to know if they confess their sin, God is going to forgive them. Amen? That's how we respond. How did we ever get to this point? How did we get to this point in our nation? How did we get to this point in the United States? How did they get to that point in New York? Well, Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, people groan. Okay, the government is nothing more than a reflection of the people. Yeah, that's more like it. Romans 1 says this, 122, they knew God. Even the devil knows God. And I, I believe everybody has a sense of there is a God. They may say it's a higher power, whatever. It is. They say they knew God. They knew what. But they didn't glorify God or they didn't give thanks. I want you to see how important it is to be thankful for what you have and how important it is to glorify God. 
Their thinking became useless. Their foolish minds were filled with darkness. They said they were wise and they became full. In other words, what they said was they weren't thankful for all that God did. They didn't give God the honor and glory. They probably knew there was a God, just like the enemy, but they didn't worship him. They really began to say, hey, I'm wise. I know what's better. I know what's good. I don't need the Bible. I don't need preaching. I don't need teaching. Look at me. Look how good I'm doing. Look where I'm at. So they became wise in their own eyes. They really became a fool. They traded the glory of God in their lives forever for the worship of idols made to look like earthly people, it says birds, animals, snakes, cars, popularity, pride, and power. Why? Because they did things, they did these things, God let them and let them go to their sinful ways. God said they just kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on. So I just turned them over to their own reprobate mind. And, and, and uh, then they wanted to do evil. It says, as a result, they became full of sexual sins, even using their own bodies the wrong way. God says, in other words, that, that, that their lust of their heart overcame them. They began to dishonor their sin. They traded the truth of God for a lie. What, what did I tell you? All sin starts, you think you're smarter than God. Either you don't know the Bible, you don't believe the Bible, or you think you're smarter than God. So what they decided to do, they traded the truth of God. Here's the truth. They traded it for a lie. They began to worship and serve what had been created instead of the creator of God. you got to be careful what you're worshiping. What you worship is what you give your time, energy, and money to. What you worship is what anything that you ready? What you worship is anything that you're going to bring satisfaction and happiness apart from God. You're worshiping those things. And he said, you better be careful. Because instead of worshiping God, you worship the things God created who, who should have been praised forever. Amen. He says, because the people did those things, what did they do? They began to worship the things that God had created instead of the creator. God left them to their own shameful things, things they want to do. Women, they stop having their natural sex and start having sex with other women. The same happened to men. They stopped having natural sex with men, and they began wanting each other. Men did shameful things to one another, to their body, receiving punishment for those things that are wrong, okay? In, in, in the same way, men did that. So let me ask you something. Is abortion really the problem? No, it's a spiritual problem. If somebody comes to our church, whether they've had an abortion, whether they are uh, uh, homosexual, no matter what they've done the night before, we are going to love them and be gentle to them because God says through that they might turn their lives around, Amen we got to do it. we we got a testimony in our own church, the wonderful testimony. I don't know if she's here tonight or not. If you just watched it long ago, she said, hey, I was in a relationship with the same sex for seven years. And she said she came to this church. They said the journey group loved her, and then she ended up getting saved. She got baptized. She's turned her life around, and she's living for the Lord. Now, see, that was because of the way it was handled. But if you're not careful, if you're not careful, see, God will turn you over to what you think you want, and when you get it, you're going to be sorry you got it. All right. Now let's talk for a few minutes about why you really came here. <laughs> what does the Bible say about abortion? Well, you've got two complete outlines. Uh, I believe life starts in, at conception. The proverb says, I mean, Psalm says in 139, it says, For you created me in my innermost parts. After God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I'll praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop. I had the children and the nursery leaders in my office today and if there's one thing I said I want you to start teaching the kids from the time they come in that nursery to their babies till they walk out into the children's department till they go into the youth department I want you to know that our kids are fearfully and wonderfully made but I want them to know that I want them to hear it at church I want them to hear it at home I want them to hear it in the back because see the world as a whole is negative and so we've got to start really implanting in our kids mind that they're fearfully and wonderfully made God knit them together he said I framed them it wasn't hid from me. I made him in, in the secret place. And when I woven them together in the depths, you know, my eyes saw them unformed body. I knew before they were there. And, and the, the days ordained for me were written in the books before one ever came. In other words, God said, I'm the one that's forming them. I'm the one that put them together. When you do that, you're interfering with God's plan for other people's life. But what do we want our kids to know? 
They're fearfully and what? Wonderfully made. When they start saying, man, people are making fun of the way I look like, hey, man, they're making fun of God because God said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So we want it to go throughout our whole church and every department. Jeremiah 1.5 said, before I was formed in my mother's womb, God, you knew me. Before I was born, you set me apart. You appointed me. Wow. He said, why is my mother's womb? You, you already anointed and appointed me. You had a purpose in my life. And in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 3, Elizabeth heard Mary his greeting, and the baby leaped in the womb. What did the baby do? Leaped. Why can you leap? Because you're alive. Amen? In Genesis 25, 22, and, and, but there was two children. They struggled with each other in the womb. I know that happens because kids fight together all the time. Amen? You think just when they got older, they started fighting. No, no, no. They, they started when they were in the womb. So I went and I asked God about it. Why is this happening to me? She said, and the Lord told her, you have sons that are in your womb. He didn't say you have two parts in there. He said, you have two sons. They're going to become two nations. From this very beginning, the two nations are going to be rivals. They already were. They were rivals in the womb, and they were going to be, one nation is going to be stronger than the other. The older son will have the sons and the younger. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she was indeed, she had twins. No kidding. Can I tell you something? If God tells you something, it's going to happen. All right? The first one, it was red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. Ugh. Not all babies are pretty, like y'all say. Some of them are oh, ugly. <laughs> they are. Can you imagine this one come out looking like that? Huh? Man, it's covered with thick red hair like a fur coat. Named him Esau. The other was a twin baby, and he, he was, his hand had grasped the heel of Esau. This was, this was in the womb. This was at the birth. They're wrestling, and he, he became Jacob. And it says Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Do you understand there was a battle going on? That there were real people? God said, you have sons in you. They began to, to wrestle with each other before they ever came out. So what do I believe? I believe that they're alive, breathing, and not breathing, alive human beings at birth. I mean at conception. Amen? So I would say that you don't have to know that. I gave you enough scripture in there in your handouts. You can read them, and you can prove God's truth. The problem is somebody that believes that most of the time, they don't want to hear what God's word says. So you've got to learn to be gentle to them. What are we to do? What are, what are we to do that believe that, we sh that people should not have abortion? Number one, we should show them mercy, gentleness, and kindness. Do you think that that's been our stance in the church? No. Do you think that's been our stance against homosexuality in the church? No. No, no. That, that, I can remember in Atlanta the churches marching up and down, uh, you know, and saying, hey, uh, you're going to burn in hell. and all. That's going to make them want to come to church. Amen? <laughs> so we're to show mercy, gentleness, and kindness, right? Second, we need to be teaching the truth to our families and in the church. I've never seen it. So many people, they, we, they don't want to talk about, you know, uh, these things that we're talking about. They don't want to talk about drinking. They don't want to talk about dancing. They don't want to talk about tattoos. They don't want to talk about sex. They don't want to talk about, they don't want to talk. Don't talk about that in church. Oh, good. Where do you want them to learn it? On TV? Social media? At school? I, I, I had the youth minister in today, Andrew. I said, listen, Andrew, I want you to, here's your outlines. They're already done. You just got to personalize them. I want you to really soon, on a Wednesday night, I want you to teach about abortion. I want you to teach their mercy. I want you to teach God's grace, but I want you to teach youth. We'll send out a note the Wednesday night before. If you don't want your kids to come, it's okay. But I can tell you, by the time they're 12, they probably know a whole lot more than you think they know. So what we have done, are y'all ready? As a church, we've turned our responsibility over to the government, and we're letting the government educate them instead of what's our responsibility. We need to take back our responsibility. It's the family and the church. Amen? <laughs> then people say, well, you should never get involved in politics. Well, that may be so, but we sure need to get involved in voting and changing laws and voting people in that believe it. Because you can do all you want, and it's not going to matter. So we need to do, we get, 
We need to know what they believe before we vote for them. Are they pro-life? Are they not? You know, you need to know those things. So you need to be involved in changing the laws or keeping the laws that are to protect us from changing the other way. Proverbs 31, 8 says, listen, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Wow. Amen? Amen. For the rights of all. Speak up. Judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So what do we do? We show love and kindness and mercy. We teach the truth in our families and our home, and we get involved in changing the laws. But we don't get into it by breaking the law. We do it by right now the best way is starting at home and electing officials. The real problem is this. You ready? Corrupt politicians, compromising preachers, and complacent people. That's what's wrong. That gets every one of us, doesn't it? That's why we're going to close with this. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, that's me and you, call my name, and they'll humble themselves. They say, God, we can't do this without you. We've got to depend upon you. And God, we want the best for other people. We want the best for your mate. You want the best for your kids. You want the best for the nation. We pray and we seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. Then God said, you're going to hear from heaven. But you know what's wonderful? I'm going to forgive their sins. I'm going to heal their land. Now, open my eyes. Now my eyes will be open and I'm going to be attentive to your prayer in this place. The problem's not the problem. The problem is a spiritual problem. We have spiritual problems because of no ultimate authority. We continue to go away from God, and we begin to do what we want in our own eyes. We get blinded to the truth, and there will be a time that God will turn you over to a reprobate mind, and you'll do what's evil instead of what's good. So what I want to do tonight is I just simply want to just, just pray and... Uh, uh, dismiss, let you go home, and uh, bring this with you, okay? Uh, would you stand with me? Hey, God, you're an awesome God. God, I pray that, first of all, you'd forgive me of my sins, and I pray that you would forgive those in our church. Uh, God, I pray that you would forgive the families. I pray, God, starting tonight, that the ones that are here tonight, the ones that are watching online that would begin to humble ourselves. And we, we, we're so controlling. We're so wanting our own, own selfish way so bad. And God, let's turn it around and want your way. And it wants your will. Turn from our wicked ways. And God, it almost said you're going to strain to hear our voice. You're going to strain to hear our prayers. And you're going to heal our nation, our families, and our lives. And God, we'll be quick to give you the honor and the glory and the praise.